start uh, to talk a little bit about our presenters today. Uh, that is uh, Matt Houlihan and David Miranda. Uh, they are from HRFM. Uh, Hesland, Rothenberg, Farley, and Mercedes is the largest intellectual property IP law firm in upstate New York, helping clients protect and enforce their IP for more than 50 years. They have 30 attorneys and patent agents and expertise in numerous technical disciplines, uh, more numerous than I care to recount here. Um, and they work with individual startups to Fortune 100 companies. Uh, their clients include domestic and foreign corporations, universities, government agencies, research centers, software companies, designers, growth companies focused on emerging technologies, venture capital firms, and individual adventures. Uh, David P. Miranda is an experienced trial attorney whose IP law experience includes trademark, copyright, trade secret, false advertising, patent infringement, licensing, internet, and related litigation. Matt Houlihan practices primarily patent prosecution in the computer hardware and software fields. Um, you can find information um, about them on hrfmlaw.com, and I will post that in the comments as well. Uh, and with that, I will hand this over to David. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, we're very excited to be part of this uh, initial uh, Center of Gravity Lunch and Learn. Uh, I was, Cheryl and I talked about this about two months ago to, to do this uh, live, and we were excited then. And I got to tell you, I'm even more excited now. This is certainly the highlight of my week, uh, perhaps, of my month. Uh, so it's the first time I put on a sports jacket uh, in six weeks. So that's like super, super big event. Uh, so thank you all for uh, joining us. Um, our firm is uh, Hessel and Rothenberg, Farley and Mercedes. We uh, are the largest IP firm in upstate New York. We're remaining fully operational uh, throughout this. Uh, we have 30 attorneys and patent agents and about 70 employees, all of whom uh, are at home working. Uh, they're at least they're supposed to be. Um, so uh, we're still we're still cooking. And so it's really, uh, uh, you know, exciting for us to be able to to be able to uh, talk to all of you. We're going to give you a little bit of a thumbnail of IP law, what it is and why it's important. Uh, but we won't go on too long. I'd like to really open the door for questions so that we're talking about things that are important to, uh, to this group. And Cheryl was kind enough to give me a little bit of background about what you're doing. So we'll try to, we'll try to uh, focus uh, the best we can on things that are important to you. I wanna, we're gonna talk about IP, which is copyrights, trademarks, patents. Um, but before we get to that, I wanna talk a little bit about why it's so important uh, to uh, to a business and to a region, um, IP is really the fuel that that powers uh, our economic growth and pro prosperity. Um, uh, over the last few decades, at least, uh, the U.S. economy has shifted. I don't know if we're going to see a shift uh, as a result of this, but if we do, um, IP is going to be of crucial importance. Economic growth. Uh, over the last few decades is really more knowledge and information driven than ever, less reliant on raw materials and uh, labor. Um, you know, we're seeing a confluence of uh, technology innovations, cloud computing, analytics, mobile devices, social media, which is really transforming uh, our economy, as you can all see. And corporate valuation has shifted from physical property to intellectual property. Uh, innovations and ideas do not in and of themselves stimulate economic growth. It's the ability to protect and commercialize uh, those ideas that provides economic value. And although intellectual property is oftentimes more valuable than personal property, uh, it can be more difficult to protect uh, against theft uh, and misuse. Uh, there's a couple of means of protection copyrights, trademarks, uh, and patents. And Matt and I are gonna give you a little bit of a thumbnail uh, of each of those so that you have an understanding of, of each of those uh, separate uh, 
uh, items of protection for intellectual property. Copyright uh, protects uh, original artistic works. Uh, it includes things like photos and books and movies and paintings and software code, architectural drawings, that types of things, things that are created. If you create something original, um, you have some copyrights to that, uh, you have copyrights to that, uh, to that work, to that material. Uh, the form that it takes is called, in legal parlance, the work. Um, and it can be anything, as I said. Uh, once you create it, the rights of, uh, in copyright go to an author. Uh, unless there is some sort of agreement or assignment uh, to the contrary. Uh, if you create something original, you get to choose what you do with it, um, and they vest with you at the time of creation. If you register your copyright, which is a separate thing to do, you get stronger protections. So for example, if you, if you register a copyright with the US Copyright Office, you have the ability to seek statutory damages up to $150,000, uh, per infringement in statutory damages, which is of crucial importance uh, when it, uh, the work that you have is difficult uh, to uh, uh, show what the value of it is. Um, you also, if you have a copyright registration, you can collect attorney's fees, which is very important uh, to me, uh, especially. Um, uh, trademarks are uh, usually a word, a phrase, a symbol, a slogan that's used in conjunction with a product or service. So it's something that you put on uh, as a brand uh, for a product. Uh, again, trademark rights accrue based upon use. So when you put the brand on a particular product and put it out uh, in the market, you accrue, at that time, trademark rights. Again, there's additional advantages. If you file a trademark registration, additional presumptions uh, that a trademark owner would have, but you have rights that accrue based upon use. Uh, trademarks are generally used. Uh, the purpose of trademarks are to protect, not only to protect the business and its right it, to its brand, but to protect the public from confusion so that when you see a brand, you can identify that there's a particular quality that's associated with it. So if you see, you know, the McDonald's Golden Arches and you go into that store, you have a pretty good idea what you're getting. Um, and no one else is allowed to uh, take that brand and then uh, provide some other perhaps inferior type of uh, quality uh, that you've associated with that brand. Uh, a trademark, again, uh, is usually a name, a word, a phrase, like uh, Nike or Just Do It. Those are trademarks. The little Nike swoosh, that's a trademark. Um, and uh, it's, trademarks are obviously very valuable. Uh, we are involved in protecting trademarks uh, on the internet, for example. Uh, we get involved in protecting trademarks in uh, domain names. Um, and they're very important uh, when you develop a brand uh, that you're able to protect it. Now, just because you have a trademark, let's say, for a particular uh, product, like say you have a trademark for, you know, Apple for computers, um, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have that trademark for everything. So the the brand that you have is associated with the goods or services that you provide so you can have apple computers and you can have apple records uh, there's not going to be confusion in the industry um, because those are two kind of separate items uh, oftentimes there's a misperception amongst the public that if you have a trademark you have it for everything and it's not true you have it for what's used in commerce uh, by you or your company um, the third category is patents, and I will uh, turn that over to Matt, and then we'll have some questions about any of these that you have for, for both Matt and I. Matt is a partner uh, at Heslin Rothenberg and Farley in the City with me, and Pat, uh, Matt works uh, mostly but not exclusively 
in the patent field. Thank you, Dave. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining uh, the session and being with us today. So um, Dave covered uh, copyrights uh, and trademarks, <clears throat> you know, for expressive works and for protecting your brand. So the third primary category of intellectual property is patents. And um, patents are meent to protect inventions. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of you might you know, when you, when you hear the word invention, you might think something mechanical and certainly, or an apparatus of some sort, and certainly um, physical products are potentially uh, patentable items. But patents would also um, be used to protect um, certain methods, methods of um, uh, undertaking a process of some sort, maybe a method of manufacturing an inventive product. Um, so there are certain um, categories of invention, uh, processes, uh, the physical products themselves, compositions of matter. So uh, new chemicals, I mean, in the pharmaceutical industry, patents are very, very valuable. Um, billions of dollars, uh, some of their patents are worth. So, uh, and certainly um, machines, uh, certain machines uh, as examples of products that might be patentable. Um, so within the patent realm, um, most patents are considered what are called utility patents, which are meant to protect the functioning of, uh, of what you've invented, the, the functional aspects of the method um, or the product. Um, there are plant patents. You, you, can, you can potentially get a patent in a, in a plant that you can asexually reproduce. Um, those are not quite as common. And then the third category of patents are design patents which actually, uh, so uh, those are common in, in the um, home decor and luxury goods, jewelry, um, and those patents, design patents, are meant to protect the ornamental features of something uh, as opposed to the, the functional aspects of it. So um, again, those are, you don't see those quite as, as often. They're, they're not as popular as utility patents, but but when most people think of patents, they're, they're thinking of a utility patent, something that has some, some utility or usefulness to it, to accomplishing something or producing something or making something. Um, so what a patent actually is, is, is a, a, a set of rights that um, the government will, will grant you if you file an application that meets the standards for patentability. Um, and, and, the, and, and if there's one single thing that you take away from this talk on patents, at least, it's that the rights that you're given are not rights to, uh, to, to make and use your, what you've invented. It's actually, it's rights to be the exclusive one to make and use the invention. It's rights to prevent others from making and using your invention, what you've patented. Um, so that's really important. It's a right to exclude. If I get a, if I file an application for a patent and a patent gets issued to me by the United States government, I can prevent others, anyone, from, from making and using what I've patented. Um, so there's an application process. Um, the preparation of an applicant of a patent application is a, um, is a, uh, it's a craft. Um, some people can prepare and file their own, but um, there are significant legal requirements. So typically one would work with um, a, a patent attorney to prepare and file a patent application. Um, once it's prepared and filed, there's an examiner at the trademark patent and trademark office that picks up the application and examines it um, to uh, assess whether it's um, truly inventive. Um, and there might be a back and forth as part of that process, back and forth between the examiner and, and the applicant, you, or the inventor, or the attorney, to um, try to work on uh, articulating exactly what it is that you've invented and what you're going to receive a patent on. Um, you, the application itself has a detailed description portion. Uh, it has several portions, but the, the primary portions are a detailed description of how to make and use what you've invented. Um, there might be some drawing figures to aid in that description. And then most importantly, with a patent application, an issued patent, there are what are called claims at the end. The claims are numbered, single sentences. Um, each claim is an articulation of 
something that you've invented and described. Um, and, and the claims are what define the scope of the protection. So they're really important. If you invent a new type of hammer and it meets the other requirements for patentability, which I'll get into in just a second, um, your claim, if you say I claim a hammer, well, that's too broad because you didn't invent a, new, a hammer, you invented a, a hammer with certain features that are inventive. Hammers exist, they've existed. So your claims would wanna dive into um, those features. And because it's the it's those features that you're going to get the patent on of hammer that does X Y and Z or is built using this material or something like that. Um, so the claims are 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 really really important. Um, there are several there's sub legal substantive requirements for your patent application that you that you need to meet in order to get issued a patent. But and then there's some formal requirements. But the the biggest requirements are number one that what you've what you're claiming is uh, useful, it has utility, and that's um, usually pretty easy to meet. Most things that you've invented, you can find some, some usefulness for it. Um, it needs to be new, or which is the same thing as novelty, and novelty refers to um, the fact that what you've come up with hasn't been done in that form before. So someone else out there has not publicly disclosed, written about, or made and sold, uh, for example, um, that which you're claiming to be inventive. The biggest hurdle usually to getting a patent is that what you are claiming needs to be not only novel, but non-obvious to people with ordinary skill in the art in which you're working. So, um, this would prevent, for example, if someone comes out with a really cool product and I say, well, that's awesome, but um, they should have made that one component out of plastic instead of metal. And I try to patent that. Well, that might get rejected because in, in, if it was obvious to simply replace the uh, metal screw with a plastic screw because there's some benefit there. So um, this prevents people from making obvious variations on someone else's invention and then patenting it. Um, so that's a really key requirement there to, to meet is, uh, is the non-obvious not requirement. Um, it's a, the patent if it's issued is a limited monopoly. So it's good for a certain period of time. Utility patents are good for 20 years from the day that you file it. Um, we, a few minutes ago before the meeting officially started, there was a question about how um, long the patent process takes. It can range from anywhere um, between about eight months at the quickest, usually to several years, depending on how long that back and forth is with the examiner. And the back and forth, by the way, just to go back is usually it involves arguments and or amendments to the claims to, to further articulate uh, something in the claims that the examiner hopefully would find to be allowable and, and would issue the patent. So 20 years for most patents, um, 14 years for design patents. Um, and, and after that, then it's in the, it's in the, it's in the public domain, really. In other words, um, anyone can make and use your, your patented invention uh, after that point and you can't enforce it against them. Um, there are some things that are not patentable. Um, if you discover, for example, a law of nature that no one else knew about, um, you can't patent it because you didn't actually invent it, you just discovered it. Um, and certain, what the patent office calls abstract, or the courts call abstract ideas mathematical formulas that sort of just represent properties between things that exist. Um, so there are exceptions. And in the computer science space and, and business, what they call business methods, methods of conducting business, you can potentially run into some problems from a um, patentability standpoint there. But that's, you know, you, you typically you would, you, you, we would dive into that with the clients to explore, okay, is this, is this gonna be, even if it's new and non-obvious, uh, is it going to be patentable subject matter? So I just thought I'd mention that. Um, so that's all I wanted to give as a primer on patents. Um, so I think at this point, it's 1230. I think it makes sense to maybe turn to question, Cheryl, if um, if you want to you know, moderate that. 
Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Matt, and thank you, David, uh, for going over those basics for us. I know I'm looking at everybody in the room, and I know we have several inventors and maybe a couple of people who have patents already. Um, I'm, I know um, there are a few people who are also interested in them. Um, so Troy has three utility patents. I know that Michael Bobsinger has um, patents, uh, nine, nine patents. Um, I see Sam uh, Wexler has unmuted and I think he has a question. So we'll go person by person. There's a little thing um, to be able to raise your hand um, electronically, but you can also just raise your hand and we'll, or put something in the chat and we'll call on you that way. Sam? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. I have one I have one issued utility patent and actually I filed it uh, through your firm with Rachel Perlman. Do you, you know her? Yes, she's a partner of ours. Yep. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now I spent a lot of money on it and I made zero money with it. So that was a big uh, learning uh, experience of, of mine. So I'm just giving you the heads up um, that I filed that in July of 2013 and then it went through in about July of uh, it was granted in July of 2016, but uh, so now I've I, I'm starting a new thing where I'm making um, kitchen tools and filing patents. I don't know if she showed you it. I have some spoons I'm working on. No, you see any? Yes, through? she hasn't mentioned it specifically. I mean, I'm oh, sure we've okay. seen I'm it come through. it out there. Yeah. Um, do you guys do anything to support inventor rights? There's this bill going through Congress right now, and it's uh, making inventor rights stronger for individuals. I'm doing volunteer work uh, to help inventors. Uh, so I guess that's my question. Are, are you doing anything to uh, really support like independent inventors? Well, certainly, I mean, we have a, a, a robust litigation team that regardless of who the client is, if they're a solo inventor or an individual or a corporate client, you know, we're going to, uh, assuming that they're a patent rights holder and they want to enforce against people, we're going to do our best to do that. I, it doesn't, I mean, it, it really, it doesn't matter if you're a solo person or a, or a massive company. I mean, the rights are your rights. And uh, I mean, typically, what, what 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 would matter is is the the costs involved, because because it can be very very expensive. That's just the nature of patent litigation in particular. And Dave can talk more about this than I can. He's the litigator, but it can be very very expensive. And if the defendant is a massive corporation with a huge patent portfolio that they might assert against your business potentially, um, it can be a real real battle. Um, so, I mean, Dave, um, do you have anything you want to add regarding, yeah. you know? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so just to answer Sam's question, first of all, we don't really get involved in lobbying um, because we represent all kinds of uh, clients uh, with all kinds of interests. And so what we do is when the laws change, we certainly advise our clients, whether they be, you know, solo inventors or big uh, companies. So, um, we kind of go with the flow as far as the law goes. There are trade organizations that get involved in that. Um, with respect to um, the cost, I, I don't think Matt talked about the cost, but I think as far as the patent goes, we probably sh should mention the, the cost because although patents can be very valuable, um, there is a, an initial cost for filing, filing fees and attorney's fees for starting that are gonna be between, I'm gonna say, and Matt can correct me, but eight and $12,000 uh, for filing a patent application, which, and possibly more if it gets complicated. So it's something that uh, certainly gives you, should give you pause. Uh, there, it's one thing to have a registered patent. It's another thing to have one that's commercially viable, um, that provides you with some uh, commercial value. Uh, the filing fees for a copyright and trademark are much less. Uh, copyright we can do for about $500, including filing fees, and a trademark for about $1,000, including filing fees. Uh, the patent uh, is very expensive. Then you might have a great patent, 
and someone's infringing it, then you got to go to litigation. And litigation can be literally in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, so the patent that you want to protect is only as good as your ability to uh, enforce it. So um, in addition to the business side of things, there's, uh, there's you know, substantial financial, financial decision making that has to be made as to whether it's worth spending $250,000 to engage in a patent infringement lawsuit when your damages are maybe $50,000. Um, and so we can provide advice and counsel on that about maybe there's another way of trying to resolve this. But we don't really get involved in necessarily, you know, helping you manufacture something. We might get involved in licensing, uh, helping with the license, but uh, the commercialization is basically up to the individual or the company. I just want to say, so I just want to say something, since this is a maker space, Tech Valley Center of Gravity, um, you know, it's really, at least I'm an, I'm an engineer by background, okay? So it's really tempting of me to want to keep on building and want to file patents and yada, yada, yada. But if you're going to file, I just want to throw this out to anybody here uh, or listening. Uh, Think about the business. You got to think about the market. All right. Think about that first, the money, and then think about the patent. If you're not making any money, don't file the patent. Okay. So I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, we have another question in the chat here from Sarah Gold um, about asking, could you speak briefly on trade secrets and the protections of those? Yeah, I'll, uh, I mean, I'll take that and, and certainly Matt can chime in. So we talked about patents, copyrights, and trademarks. Each of those have, have something in common, which is there is a federal registration. So you can file for a copyright registration with the, with the copyright office, file with the trademark, file a trademark with the USPTO, file a patent with the USPTO, all of which provides you with additional protections. Now a trade secret, on the other hand, there is no filing because it's a secret. Um, and so if you filed, it wouldn't be a secret anymore. Um, a trade secret can be any formula or compilation of information that's used in business that provides you with a commercial advantage. So, uh, you know, a common, a common trade secret that uh, people are familiar with is the, you know, the Coca-Cola syrup formula. Uh, that is, in fact, uh, protected as a trade secret. Um, it's not disclosed um, and uh, very valuable. Uh, other things that have been considered to be trade secrets are uh, some things that are more, you know, mundane. Uh, a, a beauty shop that has a customer list that keeps it private uh, can protect that as a, a trade secret. So um, if you have something that's valuable to your business uh, and is not publicly disclosed and kept uh, under uh, certain conditions that it's not released even to uh, employees without uh, protections in place, you can protect it as a trade secret and you can enforce it um, as a trade secret. The, the advantage is a, you don't have to have a registration, um, and so there's no maintenance, et cetera, that you have to file. Um, and, but you do have to take uh, precautions to make sure that it's kept as a trade secret. Um, a few years back, I represented an online university that uh, kept its test questions as a trade secret. Uh, one of the test prep agencies um, tried to uh, get the questions and the answers and put them in their uh, guidebooks that they were selling, and uh, we successfully uh, sued that a that uh, company for trade secret misappropriation. Obviously, the questions and the answers were of great value. Uh, the online educational institution went through great pains to keep them uh, secret, 
Uh, and uh, the disclosure of those obviously had a tr would have a tremendous impact, financial impact. So uh, trade secrets can come in a variety of forms, uh, can be very valuable, can be protected. Uh, it's important if you want to protect something as a trade secret that you decide that before you start using it. Um, so that you can put the steps in place to protect it before, because once a trade secret is out, it's not a secret anymore, and you're done. If you put it on your website, it's not a trade secret. Uh, so we have a follow-up question um, from Sam's question from our facilities and incubator director here at Center of Gravity, uh, Dan Falconstrom. So is there anything about the U.S. patent process that you wish was different or you really like compared to other countries? Um, there's a, I mentioned the disclosure requirement, uh, in any country in which you file your, your patent application. So each country or sometimes a collection of countries will, is considered a jurisdiction. So they will have their own patent office. So in the United States, there's the U S patent office in the United States patent office. There's a disclosure requirement to disclose how to make and use the invention as there would be elsewhere in the world as well. But in the US, I like the approach taken by the US patent system um, in terms of, um, you know, it, it, it's more like a, 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 a logical approach to the disclosure requirement. In Europe, for example, if you want to put something into a claim, a characterization on the component or a, a clarification on something, you need to have explicit, just about explicit word for word support in your description that you prepared and filed way back when you filed your patent application, word for word, pretty much. In the United States, it's a little bit more lenient. The United States says, well, let's, let's read what you, what you talked about. And you'd really don't need explicit support if it's implicit in what you're saying, we will apply some logic, human logic and say, okay, yes, we know what you were trying to say there. Although you're trying to put these words in your claim, these three words in a row, for example, or you're trying to use this particular term, but it doesn't appear in your description, clearly that's what was going on there. So we'll take a reasonable approach and we'll allow you to put that clarification in your claim. That can be really important sometimes because sometimes that clarification is what will get around some prior art that the examiner is saying um, pr is preventing you from, um, from patenting it. So I do like that. Um, the only other thing that I'll mention in the United States, unlike everywhere else in the world, is there's a, um, a grace period where everywhere else in the world, once you disclose publicly your idea, you have lost your ability to file a patent application and patent that. So typically you'd want to file an application somewhere in the world and then, and wait until you do that until you disclose. Cause again, once you disclose, you can't pursue patent protection on it. In the United States, there's a one year grace period for that. If you disclose today your idea publicly posted on a blog or something, this is the idea that I have and you describe it. The United States, as long as you file within 12 months from that point, it, your disclosure will not be a bar to patenting. Um, everywhere else in the world, is, it does not follow that. So um, whether that's a good thing, I think, you know, it's, um, that could be debated, but I think it can, it's a good thing for certain clients, that's for sure, who didn't know about that and go and talk to investors and describe their idea. And then they come to us and say, well, we want to patent this. And, they, and, and they've already disclosed. So that can really burn some people. Let me, can I follow up uh, with that just uh, a little bit? Because I think there's an important point to be made that um, patents, as well as trademarks and copyrights, those, those registrations are jurisdictional. So if you file and get a, a patent in the U.S. or a trademark in the U.S., it covers you in the U.S. It covers the manufacture and sale and distribution or use of a mark or use of a patent in the United States. It doesn't necessarily cover you around, uh, around the world. Um, our firm has agents around the world. So if someone is going to be doing business in the EU or the Pacific Rim or somewhere else, we can assist in not only getting a patent or a trademark in the US, but also making sure there's protections 
um, in, overseas, uh, where you might be, in fact, doing business and where you might be infringed. And in fact, we in turn, uh, we get about 20% of our firm's business from overseas for people that we work with in the EU and the Pacific Rim that want to have protections in the U.S. Uh, for their products. And so we have uh, do quite a bit for, you know, an upstate law firm would do quite a bit of international practice. But it's important to remember that uh, for the most part, the, the, the registrations you get are jurisdictional uh, in the location in which you, you get them. We have um, another question from Troy Fisher. Have any of your clients been in a situation where a competitor has tried to invalidate their patent? Dave, that's yeah. you. The answer is yes, but Dave, you can talk. Yeah, about. all the time. So you're involved in, uh, you have a patent and uh, somebody is infringing it. And so, and you you look at you know you look at the, your patent you look at the patent that we have, and then we we go through uh, the the competitor's product and we go through the claims and we got them dead to rights on every one, and then you know we send them a, a, a cease and desist and they they you know they blow us off and then you bring a lawsuit and so we've got them nailed on uh, infringement so. One of the ways, one of the defenses is that, um, well, your patent should be invalidated. Uh, yeah, it's infringing, but you know what? You didn't even, you shouldn't have had this patent in the first place because there was prior art that was out there for years in advance. Um, the patent office somehow missed it. Uh, and, you know, your patent that you're now trying to enforce uh, is invalid because. Uh, there was prior art out there. That's one way, uh, certainly, in which uh, to have a patent invalidated. And so now we're not fighting in the litigation over um, over the infringement. We're fighting over the invalidity. And you know, um, sometimes there is an issue, uh, and sometimes there isn't an issue. And sometimes the other side will just use that as a, kind of a bargaining chip to try to say, well, look, this is not only gonna go one way, where well, you're not gonna win and get damages. There's a chance here that if you don't win this case, that you're gonna not only lose this case, but you're gonna lose your patent, and you're gonna lose all the other licenses that you now have in place. You don't wanna do that, so maybe we should try to come to some reasonable settlement. So it's not uncommon. Um, I gotta say though, ordinarily, you know the patent prosecution process is is very rigorous. Um, there's, for the most part, um, it's when a patent makes it through that process, it's uh, more likely than not that it's going it, to there's validity to it. Okay, we have a question from Kayla Miller. What are the common law protections for an unregistered copyright? Can you copyright educational curriculum by, via common law? And does this apply to online content as well? Uh, yes, copyright does apply to online content. Uh, the common law protections are if you are the creator of an original work, and by creator, that means you put it down in some form, uh, whether it be on paper or the back of a napkin or online. Uh, you can't just have it in your head. Um, once you express that idea somehow, you have uh, some common law copyright protections to it. Now, that's great, and you're the copyright owner. Um, it's more difficult to enforce if you don't have a registration. Uh, it's more difficult to recover damages if you don't have a registration. Uh, some people have, you know, there's this, uh, you know, rumor that you can have, a, you know, a poor man's copyright where you write down whatever, you know, book you have and then you mail it to yourself. Um, it's not even worth the stamp that you've, you've put on uh, the envelope. Um, if you have, uh, you don't have any additional rights just because you mailed it to yourself. Um, 
So if you think something is worthwhile to protect, uh, you should file it with the Copyright Office. The filing fee, I think, is uh, maybe $60. Um, if you have an attorney uh, do it for you, it ends up being a couple hundred dollars. So if there's some value uh, to the work, uh, it's worth having a registration. You have rights. Your rights accrue upon creation. Um, but the enforcement of those rights are more difficult without a registration. Okay, we have a question from Christy Hutchins from, for a new company trademark with a product in development but not yet in the market. Is it better to apply before use or use TM until you proceed with an actual registration? If you proceed using only a TM and someone files for it or similar to the USPTO before you, what is the situation then? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, TM should be used on a product. Uh, even if you don't have a registration, uh, you should definitely use the TM. Uh, you'll see uh, sometimes uh, the R with a circle. Um, that is reserved only for registered marks. So you're not permitted to use the R with a circle until you get a registration from the, the USPTO. So until that time, you can use a TM. Um, there's something uh, in the trademark office called an intent to use application. So even if you have the idea for a brand uh, uh, that's going to go on, you know, whatever you're making, sneakers or hats or um, whatever else your product is, if you're not actually using it, you can file an intent to use application. And the advantage of that is you get uh, a priority date dating back to the date that you filed the application. Usually your priority will go to the date that you started using the mark, but if you file the intent to use application, you get priority dating back to the time that you filed the application, even though you don't start using the mark for another couple of months or in some instances, uh, you know, a year or two. Um, so we often file, especially for, uh, you know, companies that, uh, or individuals that know they're going to go forward with a particular mark and there might be some buzz about it before the product comes out um, and they don't want someone to, you know, beat them to the punch. Uh, so we'll file an intent to use application. It's, it will be an intent to use application. Once you start using it, it will be converted to a use uh, and then eventually a registration. So there are ways to protect uh, your brand uh, even before you start using it. And I, you know, it's advisable. There's a lot of ins and outs of it. Um, it's advisable to talk to counsel, you know, before you start using a, a mark on a, on a product. We can do searches, um, and we do searches as well, comprehensive landscape searches, to see what's out there with your product. If there's anybody else using a brand, because you don't want to put fifty or $100,000 into you know, labeling and promoting a product if there's already someone that has priority out there with respect to your trademark. So we do comprehensive trademark uh, review to check what's out there that's registered, what's out there that might be in use that's not registered. So this way, when you do put all this money into your product and your brand, um, you have some comfort that uh, you're not going to be, uh, in, you know, start off being involved in a lawsuit which is the, you know, the last thing that you want. So our next question is from Kyle Moisey. What happens to intellectual property after the 2014, 20 slash 14 year timeframe for utility design patents? Is there a protected timeframe for copyrights and trade secrets? Can something feasibly be protected globally? Um, I'll let Matt, why don't you talk about what happens after patents and I can talk about Copyright and trademark. Okay, once an issued patent expires, no matter what jurisdiction, whether it's in the United States or a European patent or something, um, once it's expired, then you no longer have rights to enforce your, your patent rights. Your patent rights are extinguished at that point. You don't have any more to enforce uh, against people, so they can make and use, practice the invention all they want. Um, uh, it's possible that maybe you developed um, during the pendency of or the um, the uh, enforceability period of your patent. It's possible that you 
came up with some extensions on that, you know, some additional ideas that you separately patent as a way to continue um, an enforceability period for those follow-on patents. Um, but for the, once something, once a patent that you have expires, it's expired and you don't have rights anymore. Um, it, Dave, I guess, can talk about the copyrights, trade secrets, um, and then can something feasibly be protected globally? From a patent standpoint, again, there are jurisdictions. Um, there's a what something called a, that people refer to as an international patent application, a PCT application, which is um, it doesn't uh, it gets examined, but it doesn't mature into a worldwide patent. Instead, you file nationally from from the PCT application. So that could be your first filing the PCT application to get your priority date. So that if someone comes up with your idea and discloses it after you've beaten them to that. So you get your patent application in as a PCT application. And then there's timeframes associated with all this, but you can enter individual countries, the US, Australia, China, the EU, et cetera, from that PCT application, but ultimately you will need to, in whatever jurisdiction that you want protection, you will need to file a patent application in that jurisdiction and it will be examined and then you'll um, hopefully get an issued patent at that point. So, uh, so the other thing with respect to patents, I mean, there's a public policy purpose here, as Matt uh, stated before, you, you do have a limited monopoly during those 20 years. In exchange for that, when those tw and to make your money and to uh, you know the profit off of it, in exchange for that, it goes into the public domain after 20 years to do, you know, uh, some some public good for everyone. You you often you'll see that with uh, you know drug manufacturers uh, after the patent expires, you'll see a lot of generics come out that are much cheaper than um, the original. With respect to copyright, uh, the term for a copyright registration is the author's life plus 70 years. So that's a pretty long time. Um, and you'll often see sometimes with valuable copyrights, they'll be part of the estate. And the, state, the estate uh, will enforce uh, royalties and be able to get a you know, stream of income. If it's a corporation and is, that owns the copyright, not a, a, an individual author, but a corporation, it's for 95 years uh, that the copyright runs to the uh, corporation. And that's one filing, one registration. You don't have to renew, you don't have to maintain. Um, that's just the, the, the single filing. Trademark's a little bit different. Uh, trademarks can go in perpetuity as long as you continue to uh, use the mark in conjunction with the product or service, and every 10 years, file a renewal of that mark with the trademark office. So uh, if we file a trademark registration, we get it, the, the product is being marked with it. Uh, every 10 years, we have a calendaring system and we'll remind our client that we need to file a renewal. And if they file that renewal and they are continuing to use it, then um, it will continue in perpetuity. If they, stop if they stop using the mark for a period of three years, the mark can become abandoned and then it kind of reverts back to the public domain. So copyrights, a uh, pretty long period of time, like I said, 70 years plus uh, the, li uh, the life of the author plus 70 years, trademarks uh, in perpetuity if they're renewed um, every 10 years. And then one very quick follow-up um, with, it, it, can you explain the time frame for trade secrets? And then also would library archives be considered to be the public domain? Uh, trade secrets in perpetuity forever. As long as you keep it a secret, you've got those rights. Um, as long as it's not released, uh, you know, to the public um, and it's kept, you know, uh, private. Um, library archives, I think in most instances, would be considered a public release. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I'm, there may be a way that you could do it where the public can't look at it, but a release to libra library archives, um, I'm, I would think would be a, a, a public release. Great. Thank you. Uh, so hitting about one o'clock. Uh, David and Matt, do you have time to continue answering questions? We have quite a few still. 
I'm happy to stay on. Yeah, sure. All right, excellent. Um, so our next question is from Rob Smith. Um, Rob, registered copyrights on two books that are currently being given away free by Internet Archive. Uh, the giveaway amounts to about 100 copies so far, 50 each. Does he have any recourse and should he use it if he does? Oh, wait, so it's giving, it's being given away for free without his uh, Rob, authorization? Uh, right. Feel free they to. Do a, they do it by, to a lot of authors, thousands. I'm just one of many. Uh, yeah, the answer would be yes. Um, you, if you have a copyright and they've and you haven't given them any authorization to copy and release your book, I mean that's the, that's the very essence of infringement. Um, it doesn't matter that they're not making money off of it, um, because uh, you know what you look at is the fact that uh, the copyright owner uh, has the right to control their work, and uh, the copyright owner. Uh, may have been able to sell those works um, if they weren't being uh, offered for free. So mm -hmm. I don't know all the circumstances of, of what's gone on, uh, but just because someone is giving it away for free doesn't mean it's not copyright infringement. Uh, it still could be. And as long as you did not provide any written authorization mm -hmm. uh, for them to do that, uh, you would have a claim for infringement. Now, um, Again, this is where the copyright registration becomes important because if there are, um, it might be difficult for you to prove damages for a book that maybe, you know, wasn't, uh, you know, a huge seller. But if you had a registration that predated the infringement, uh, you could get statutory damages and that makes things a lot easier for you. Hmm. Uh, so our facilities director posted in the chat that there's a great debate about how internet archives work in regards to copyright and the link uh, is in the chat. So um, if Rob, if you're interested in that or if anybody else is interested in that, um, please take a look. Um, I'm going to do Rob's next question too, since we are already here. Um, so you owned a small chapter S corporation called Elder Source that went out of business and your name was trademarked by someone else. Almost oh, right. immediately, yeah. Okay, and and do you still have a right to use your old business name if it right. has been trademarked by someone else? Well, um, if you didn't have a trademark, if you didn't register a trademark, uh, yeah. you have rights that are based upon your use. Uh, that's what I said, you know, originally. So if you don't have the registered trademark, uh, or even if you did, once you stop using the mark in conjunction with uh, the the products, um, you know the rights kind of the rights dissipate. Um, so there are some variations to that. I mean, the all the whole uh, trademark law is based upon likelihood of confusion. So I don't know what the name was. I don't know if you were it's associated with something else. Um, so there could be confusion in the public as to the source. Um, your your rights are are certainly weakened once you're no longer doing business under uh, under that that mark. So I'm not sure. I'm not certain. Uh, trademark uh, infringement issues are all very fact intensive. Uh, it takes into account not only the facts of what the trademark owner was doing. Uh, and how the trademark owner was protecting the mark, but how uh, the potential infringer's conduct was, and importantly, what the public perception of that mark uh, is. So there's usually not a, a very easy yes or no uh, answer. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, our next question comes from Michael Lobsinger. Michael Lobsinger is our board chair here at Tech Valley Center of Gravity, and he's also the vice president uh, for business growth solutions at Center for Economic Growth. His question is, uh, you've been talking about this idea of timing. How does timing play for when you should apply, and how do you balance applying too soon versus the research and discovery period that could lead to additional claims? Well, it's a it's a really good question um and and it's one that clients and and we struggle with 
with clients all the time. It's a trade-off. Um, on the one hand, generally you want to file, uh, um, uh, I, I assume you're talking about a patent patents here, uh, Mike, but um, generally you want to get your patent application in as soon as you can, because you don't want someone to beat you to the patent office. If they do, then uh, your potential to patent your idea is almost gone. Probably nothing at that point. So you want to get your application in, but on the other hand, if you're still developing and after you file your application, you might um, come up with some extensions or developments, you can't add those into your application that you already filed. You can't amend into your application after it's filed new, new matter, it's called. So it's, it's a balancing act, okay? Uh, there is this, what's called a provisional patent application in the United States, which kind of sets your place. You file it today, you get a year to perfect it, it's called. But um, I can talk about that more if, if you want to hear more about it. But um, generally, you don't want to rely on filing a provisional. And then, and then certainly, if you're coming up with new matter after the provisional, ideally, you do not want to have to add that into your non-provisional filing. So um, where to draw the line is a tough question to answer. You do you absolutely need to disclose enough for a person having ordinary skill in the art to make and use your invention or what you want to claim as your invention. So if you have an idea, but you're not quite sure how to make it, and maybe you've got some ideas that might work, but you're not really sure, uh, you probably don't want to file at that point. You should do some experimentation, for example, or, or work on it a little more, because if you're not sure, and if you're skilled in the art, you're not going to be able to describe enough for others it was, uh, to, to make and use it. Um, some experimentation is okay. You can disclose enough that if it requires some level of experimentation, that's all right. But um, if it requires more innovation in order to produce something that's working, you don't want to file at that point. So I, I, it's a long answer. Yeah, Sam, you have a question? Yeah, I just want to say something. Well, uh, Matt, what do you think about, like, say, uh, filing a provisional yourself at first, and then you can file more provisionals and then roll that into a utility? What do you think about that? Well, it's an option. Um, unless someone's gone through the patent process and, and has a strong grasp on the legalities involved and the requirements, I, I would advise I would, I would suggest to that person that they use a patent attorney or at least talk with them to see if that's the best approach. You know, self-filing or provisional, yeah, it'll get you a filing date, but in all likelihood, once you, unless you're a seasoned inventor and you really know how, you know how to speak the language of patent applications, when you talk with your patent attorney, the patent attorney is probably gonna wanna massage, at least massage things and maybe completely rework the application. Um, so, Yes, it's one strategy to, to get a filing date, but it generally you want to develop the idea, work with the patent attorney to figure out whether it's developed enough to the point where it meets some of the legal requirements. Um, even if you're still working on it a little bit, if the, if the types of things that you might discover after we prepare and file the application are very minimal, they're obvious little variants, or they're just kind of finding an ideal range of something you would, might consider filing at this point. With a, with a full disclosure. Yeah, can I add on to my question in a sense? Um, Michael, uh, so even what about like improvements on patents? So someone has a patent that's out there, but then you cite it and you make an improvement on it. Well, so the standards for patentability would say your even in your improvement needs to be new. Uh, and non-obvious. So if it's an obvious improvement, even if it's an improvement, that's not enough. If it's an obvious improvement, that's not good enough. It needs to be a non-obvious improvement. And you're still cannot practice it if it, you still need to do it. If, if, if practicing your non-obvious improvement, you can file, you can file the patent application and maybe even get a patent. Whether or not you can actually make and use what you've patented, uh, that's a different inquiry. Again, that goes back to what I said before, the rights that you get in a patent is not a right to actually make and use your invention because you might be infringing someone else's patent at that point. So yeah, you'd have to look at that first patent on upon which you improved to see if the claims cover what you're doing. 
Okay, our next question comes from Beth Bornick. Beth Bornick is another one of our board members at Tech Valley Center of Gravity. Um, and her question is, what IP concerns come into play for adapting commercial products or reverse engineering parts for COVID response, like alternatives to ventilators, face shields, or respiratory protection? Do you want me to take that, Dave? Yeah, here, take it, Matt. Sounds like more of a patent. Yeah, so um, with reverse engineering things, um, there's nothing per se illegal about that, but sometimes you're under um, an, a contract not to do that. So when you purchase a product or you work with a service that you subscribe to or something, there might be something in the terms that say that it, where you agree not to reverse engineer what, what you're using. Like part of the, your use of that is your promise not to reverse engineer it. So there might be some contractual issues to reverse engineering something. Um, adapting commercial products. So um, there's a, a doctrine where if someone has a patent on a, on a, a machine, the patent covers some functioning of the machine, for example, and they sell it to you and you buy it. Um, there's a doctrine that says they've exhausted their patent rights with respect to that machine. You, so you, you could sell that machine to your friend and, and you're not committing patent infringement at that point. Adapting it, again, assuming there's no contract or something to the contrary, yeah, you can adapt the product too. Um, however, if you sell the product at that point, you may be infringing someone else's patent. Um, if you've adapted the product in such a way that now it functions or performs in, in a way that is covered by someone, maybe a third party's patent over there, um, it, it all depends on how you adapted it. So um, um, parts for COVID response, I don't think that that aspect of the question, the COVID response, I don't think that that would really matter what, whether, you know, that it's uh, because we're going through this COVID pandemic that that would really play into, um, you know, whether or not you're infringing something. Um, Dave, do you have any other thoughts on the IP concerns with adapting? I would say a big thing is license, is terms of use and making sure you're not doing something you didn't agree to, you agreed not to. Yeah, no, I, I don't have anything else to add okay. uh, to that. I mean, obviously, if there's a, a contract in place, the terms of that contract will uh, most likely uh, prevail. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no, I don't, and I don't think the fact that it's COVID related has changes anything. So our next question is from Joanne D. Frank. I have a trademark for a new brand. I had to take a photo of my product. I'm not ready to file for a patent, but I do have to, but do I have to go by the one year rule here? Okay, so I think there's a couple of questions interspersed in that question. So um, I'm not sure what one year rule is being referred to. Uh, the, there's a one year, you know, rule for uh, patenting. Uh, trademark, I mean, like I said, your rights are based upon your use of the product. Uh, there's not a requirement that you file a registration, a trademark registration at any time. I mean, so for example, if you were using a trademark since 2010, I could, we could file a trademark for you today, a uh, trademark registration that indicates that your date of first use was, uh, you know, January 1st, 2010. Um, assuming that there was no other use in between that time and no other registrations in between that time, your priority date in most instances would in fact be the date that you've claimed, which would be January 1st, 2010. Um, if there was a dispute over it, you'd have to be, you'd have to establish that you filed it, that you were using it in 2010, but the trademark, uh, the trademark registration provides you with certain presumptions that uh, that was your date of, uh, date of use. With respect to taking a picture, um, when you file a trademark application for a particular trademark, uh, on uh, you know particular goods, 
you also need to file a specimen showing how that mark is used in commerce. So if you have a product and your, your trademark is on the wrapper, then we show the product with the wrapper and we file that as your specimen, as your proof of use. Um, again, uh, the one year time period is, doesn't really come into play. Um, you would need to, you could file without a photograph of the specimen, um, but that would be as an intent to use uh, application. Once you want to convert it to a use, if you're converting it to a use, you're obviously using it. You have to show the trademark office how you're using the mark in conjunction with the product or service. If Dave, is, is a specimen, do you know if that's considered a public disclosure within the patent law of trademark specimen that you filed? I would think it would be. I would think it would be as well. Yes. Yep. Okay, our next question uh, is actually from Michael Lobsinger. Um, we, so just a little bit of background on this is as um, a makerspace, we have had many members um, and staff who are um, using open source design to make um, face shields, respirators, and things like that. Um, Michael's question, as a makerspace, we also have contributed to COVID-19 response on open source websites. Where can we go to learn more about the language used in open source, i.e. sharing without attribution? And then there's four um, checkboxes here, remix culture allowed, commercial use, free cultural works, and meets open definition. Um. So open source can be really, really tricky. The best source for learning about a particular license is the language of the license itself. That can be tricky because there are different versions of licenses. Um, that's where we would start the language of the license. I don't have any specific suggestions for websites that walk through the language or that dive into detail about the language in an unbiased manner. Um, Certain outfits out there um, are uh, anti-copyright and are champions of open source licenses, which ironically are, are copyrights uh, or copy lefts. But um, so, 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 you know, when you read advice, it's from certain sites, they will sort of try to uh, slant things in, in a way that's not necessarily legally sound. On top of that, there haven't been, to my knowledge, a, a whole bunch of cases that have litigated open source license terms. So definitely there are par portions that are open to interpretation. So um, I wish I had a better suggestion on websites that would kind of break down. I, I've, I've, I've gone through several open source licenses and I've, I've produced like mat matrices or tables that break down requirements under each. Um, usually that's on a, on a case by case basis and especially the application of those licenses to the, to what the client is doing is, is very fact specific. So, um, it, it can, it can be tough. Um, Dave, do you have anything to add regarding that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say probably the most, uh, you know, unbiased and helpful website, uh, regarding copyrights at least is going to be the copyright office website, which can be found at LOC. Dot gov, uh, LOC standing for Library of Congress. That's where copyrights are uh, are are filed and and controlled. So go to loc.gov for information regarding what's copyrightable and uh, the various uh, aspects of it. Uh, very helpful and and very thorough. So I think that's. All of the questions that we have. Um, we really appreciate your time today, David and Matt. Um, I quickly want to give a plug to our manufacturing incubator, which, which hosted this today. Um, our manufacturing uh, incubator director and facilities director is here, um, Dan Falkenstrom, um, and I'm just going to let him speak quickly about our program. Yes, really quick. So part of our community is the, includes the manufacturing incubator program. Uh, which provides mentorship and assistance to people who are developing prototypes and trying to transition uh, from prototype to scalable manufacturing. Uh, and uh, patent questions come up a lot of times during the process. So 
um, this is something that we, you know, bring in law firms like this to, to kind of help out. We can help get people to the right resource they need, uh, whether it's figuring out how to manufacture something or trying to figure out what types of IP protection are, are good for you. Thank you, Dan. Um, and with that, I do want to mention that tomorrow we have an event called Hatched every first Thursday of the month at 630. Uh, we get a group of inventors together and people show off what they're doing and get feedback and ask questions. So that's every first Thursday of the month. That'll be tomorrow at 630. You can find uh, the Zoom information on our Facebook site or check your email if you're part of our email list. Um, and we're also doing, so Food for Thought is a virtual luncheon that we're going to have every first Wednesday of the month. And our next, um, our next luncheon, our next virtual luncheon uh, will actually be presented by Michael Lapsinger, who's on this call as well. Um, he's going to be presenting on funding and resource development for startup manufacturing. Um, David and Matt, do you have anything uh, that you would like to impart? Any words of wisdom to impart to us on, on our way out today? Oh, just, I just would like to thank uh, you, Cheryl, uh, for putting this together uh, and for continuing it and to thank everyone that's on the call. Uh, it's certainly our pleasure. I, I look forward to the opportunity to perhaps uh, in the future coming down and maybe we can do something, uh, something else in person uh, when we're all able to get together. But uh, my pleasure and it's been, it's been great talking to all of you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. No, uh, Dave said it. I, I appreciate everyone's time and great questions. Um, and, uh, you know, hope you can take something away. And yeah, I'd be happy to come down um, as well and do something in person. It sounds like people have a lot of questions. Um, so that's great. And we'd be happy to help. Yeah, this is, this is always a topic that comes up a lot. I know Sam held, held an event a couple months ago and it kind of turned into a one hour Q and A with the company about their patent adventures. So there's uh, always questions and opportunities to, to help people learn about this process more. We recorded this today. So once we edit it up a little bit, we will release this for consumption. So if you have um, other people who you think are interested in this information, please don't hesitate to um, have them go to our website or speak directly to us. If you have um, IP questions or you need an IP uh, or patent attorney, please consider HRFM Law. And we have a bunch of different uh, links in the chat, um, which we'll put out on our social media as well, along with the little snippets of wisdom that we've got from the program today. Uh, thank you again, everybody, and everybody stay safe. Uh, and we hope to see you in person sometime soon and take David and Matt up on their offer to, to do this live. So thank you again, everyone. Great. Look forward to it. Stay well. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.